Thanks really a lot for the invitation. It's always a pleasure for me to be at home. And um, um, as some of you know, maybe for last 10 years, uh, my lab is focusing on studying uh, synaptic plasticity under physiological and some pathological conditions. And today I will present you slightly a um, different topic. And uh, the <coughs> main question that I will talk today is um, uh, uh, the the, the, we, we all of us know, right, that neural cir circuits basically maintain the delicate ba balance between stability and flexibility and really constantly changing environment. And this is really a non-trivial task, right? For example, when all of you first time saw the face of Al Pacino, right? Some circuits and visual cortex um, build the representation of his face. However, when you see uh, his face and different appearance, we still can recognize him, and if you think it's really simple, it's not, right? Because these circuits should adapt, right, to changes in uh, um, the actor appearance, and the question, how does it happen? And how our circuits perform this non-trivial task? This task is really non-trivial due to very simple uh, facts, right? For example, if we think about our neurons, which construct our circuits, they live in Jewish culture, we say 120 years, but at least 100 years, right? However, when we think about really molecular composition of all the molecules comprising and which are important for electrical activity of these neurons, for example, like receptors and ion channels, we can find different numbers, but if we group all of these numbers, they live much shorter lifetime, right? From hours, days to maybe weeks. And the question, how do our circuits maintain the stability under constantly changing environment, as I already told you? During the last 50 years, uh, there is enormous amount of information that we learn about mechanisms underlying plasticity of neurons and synapses, right? For example, all of us know, right, about long-term potentiation or long-term depression that synapses can undergo. We know about plasticity of, of ion channels or intrinsic excitability. And obviously, all of us know about possibilities of structural plasticity. And when we read all of these uh, beautiful papers that have been written during many, many uh, years and really extensively studied, the uh, underlying assumption behind this is that this really changed the behavior of neural circuits. And the question if whether it's really true, whether all kind of changes, synaptic changes or changes in intrinsic excitability or structural changes really affect the property of neural networks. And basically today I will try to address a very simple question that we asked several years ago. Mm -hmm. To what extent do individual neurons and population of neurons maintain stable activity patterns over extended time scales? And uh, basically when we talk about stability of any circuitry, right? We can think about homeostatic control system that this circuitry must have. And the principle of uh, working of this homeostatic control system is really very simple, and I just briefly describe it. So the system has some set point, right? Um, and uh, in order to maintain some property or critical properties of the system around this set point, we have a controller, right? We have a, f a sensor. We have a feedback control system, right, that sends the error signal, and this error signal uh, tell to the uh, controller to change um, the parameter and to adjust it to return it to the certain set point. And during last, I would say, 20 years, really very uh, elegant uh, studies have been devoted to study this homeostatic control system which are uh, connected to our um, uh, neuronal circuits. And during uh, these 20 years, it has been shown that chronic changes in activity trigger really, really a wide repertoire of adaptive mechanisms. 
For example, all of you know the famous and seminal work of uh, Larry Abbott, Gina Durujana, and Sasha Nelson, <coughs> who proposed uh, homeostatic scaling of quantum amplitude, right? It's a postsynaptic mechanism. Later, have uh, other people discovered that not only quantum amplitude can be scaled, but also presynaptic parameters could be changed, for example, release probability, and this uh, fact really made a lot of problems to the grand theory of uh, homeostatic scaling because initially it has been proposed based on theoretical grounds and uh, the idea was to preserve the learning rules in the system constant, right, and just uh, uh, adjust the synaptic parameters equally at all the synapses. So later also it has been shown that intrinsic excitability can be adjusted and obviously, very important, the balance of excitation to inhibition can be changed in order to maintain right, the system around some uh, homeostatic set point. However, despite all these uh, beautiful results, some questions, and really I would say very <coughs> elementary questions, uh, remained open. And uh, first of all, if you read the books or reviews, you can find in all of them, right, and it's really widely assumed that homeostatic mechanisms operate at a cell autonomous level, meaning that each neuron has an ability to detect the deviation from its own firing rate and to fix itself, right? And the questions that we ask, the, uh, actually there is no real data to support this uh, assumption in the literature. And the questions that we asked are really cell autonomous mechanisms sufficient to confer population for instability? The second question that we ask, again, when you read textbook or review, you can find a very uh, work sentence stating that each system maintain, nervous system, uh, maintain basic neuronal function. <coughs> And it's really unclear what are these basic neuronal functions that the system maintain, and we were curious to address it. A third, following really a, a beautiful work of Yaniv Ziv, who now is in Weizmann Institute, and basically in his postdoctoral study, he really nicely showed that he used miniature microscope and did calcium imaging in behaving mice, and he showed that at, at the level of place cells, right, the uh, representation of the space code at the level of network was stable. However, at the level of individual single place cells, it was extremely unstable during uh, 45 days that he recorded. So more than 70% uh, of neurons were completely unstable in, uh, in the C1 region of behaving mice. And then we ask a very simple question, do this interneuronal dynamics stem stems really from intrinsic variability of neurons comprising the network, or alternatively, it just reflects different behavioral states or some extrinsic changes that happen in cortex and so on and so on. And finally, uh, what we're uh, trying to understand is what are the key homeostatic <laughs> molecules that are essential for network stabilization. If you uh, look carefully the literature, we know a lot of uh, very essential molecules that are essential for stabilization of drosophila neuromuscular junction. However, we don't really know almost anything about key molecular, reg molecular regulators of homeostasis of CNS in mammalian system. And in order to address this question, we first of all decided to start from the most simple preparations that we can use, right, is um, cultured hippocampal network. And uh, uh, under this condition, we can really control all the external environment, right, as, as most really precisely as we can. We can use long-term recordings using, using multiple electrode arrays and calcium imaging. And uh, uh, everything is very stable. And during two days of recordings that we do, we have really minimal uh, movement, uh, less than 0.2 micron. And uh, we obviously use standard <coughs> electrophysiology and imaging of synaptic activity to see homeostatic adaptations in this system. 
So first of all, I just would like to present to you perturbation. And at that point, when we started the project, it was just really random uh, selection. There is nothing special about GABA B receptors. The only knowledge that uh, was important at that point is that they really widely distributed in all the neurons, in excitatory and inhibitory neurons, and in any brain region. I almost don't know any brain region that GABA B receptors are not expressed. And the effect of agonists of GABA B receptors are extremely robust. So I just briefly explain you that if we add agonists we use baclofen of GABA B receptor, which act as a GABA, right, very similar to GABA, we get, first of all, synaptic inhibition, right, as all of you know, but it's not a simple synaptic in inhibition, right, you know, as any G protein coupled receptor, it has a frequency dependent synaptic inhibition, meaning that it's much more effective for inhibiting mm -hmm. single spikes, synaptic transmission during single spikes, comparing to synaptic transmission during spike bursts, okay? You can see a shift in, a, in affinity, right, right, right shift. It's much less effective for inhibiting bursts. And obviously, any one of you who are using electrophysiology, you know that if you add this, this has been done in slices in this case, when you add baclofen, okay, it, it almost completely can inhibit synaptic transmission during low frequency stimulation, but you can see that it enhances synaptic transmission, it enhances synaptic facilitation, sorry, during uh, high frequency stimulation, and you can see the quantification that facilitation from the first to the last um, EPC is enhanced. So this is the perturbation that we used, and uh, basically uh, we combine it to recording of spikes, right, using multiple electrode arrays, you can see this is a system, and we could record multi-unit spike, and we could use principal component analysis to um, um, divide it to single unit at uh, the level of each electrode. And I just show you what happens for a moment when we add a uh, baclofen. So this is, you can see, a raster plot of normal spontaneous activity in hippocampal network. And when we add 10 micromolar of baclofen, you can see complete inhibition in the network. So immediate effect is complete inhibition. There is no almost spiking in the network. And the question that we ask, how a system react when we chronically, right, add baclofen, the baclofen is a drug chronically uh, perfused in the system. And I would like to show you um, just the real data. Okay, so you can see this is a uh, time x-axis is time and y-axis is just uh, single units. You can see some spontaneous activity in the network, right? Nothing special. Uh, we get a very similar uh, distributions of firing rate to uh, published by Bozaki Group in Vivo. So it's um, basic activity. Then you can see the data after four hours uh, when baclofen is present in the dish, and I hope that all the students can uh, clearly see that effect is very robust, right? So the firing rate is still reduced, right? But it becomes much more synchronous, right? So you can see it very, very easily. And we, I just uh, show you the snapshots because <coughs> we record continuously. And when, you lo when we look two days in the presence of baclofen, what you can see? Hmm? Yeah, it it's looks like firing activity is back in terms of mean rate, right? And uh, in terms of pattern as well, it's uh, come back to be desynchronized. So we decided to quantify uh, these experiments. And uh, here I can show you this is individual experiment, right? You can see many units firing at different firing rates. When we add baclofen, you can see firing rate is almost completely inhibited. And during two days in the presence of the drug, it's gradually uh, renormalized. Re Obviously, it's very important to see the data without presence of any drug. Just control experiment, you can see that firing rates of many, many units remains pretty stable. And when we average uh, many experiments of these types, it's six or seven experiments, you can see that under control conditions, the firing rate is stable during two days of recording, on average, of course, right? And when we add baclofen, 
on average we see profound inhibition, almost total inhibition and renormalization of average firing rate to the basal level, right? So when we are looking at distribution, you can see a normal log distribution and the distributions of firing rate is very, very similar in the basal recordings and two days after application of baclofen and we can conclude, right, I, I think you can um, agree with me based on this data, that firing rate at least is homeostatically preserved at the level of population, right? And basically a year ago it has been published in Neuron, a paper of uh, Gina Turijana, uh, who showed in vivo very similar d data for monocular deprivation, okay? And the second question that we ask, right, of course, and first of all, we were really surprised how robust these experiments are, okay? And uh, the second question we, that we ask, do we have the same kind of stability in terms of renormalization at the level of individual neurons? And uh, Elie and Elkin really helped us to make a lot of analysis in this paper. And uh, first of all, we just compared the same neuron, right? without any perturbation, and this was really shocking for us, <coughs> the results. This is no perturbation, it's just 48 hours of recording. You can see y-axis, it's a log plot, log log plot, baseline mean rate during first hour, and the y is, mean, uh, is the firing rate during the last hour, after 48 hours, or last two hours. And we made bootstrapping statistics to decide which neurons were stable, which neurons uh, decrease or increase the firing rate. And as you can see from this plot, the blue spots, these are neurons which decrease their firing rate, statistically significant. Red spots, the neurons that increase their firing rate, and only the green spots which were stable. I would like to uh, uh, make sure, obviously you can see very nice correlation, right? The neurons who fire uh, very strongly, they still fire at high rate, right? But they are not at the same rate, okay? It's a statistical significant difference during two days. <coughs> so basically, when you see this data, you understand, and uh, later on, uh, we talked to Shimon Marom, who told us that he published it in some physical journal many, many years ago, and it's obvious for him, right? But we as biology, was, it, it was completely not obvious. And we understand that when you, un you see this data, it's just, completely wrong to ask this question about homeostasis at the level of single neuron because the fluctuation at firing rate we see at any time scale that we change. It's not a surprise for anyone that we see fluctuations at millisecond, second and minutes range, but we did not know that we also can find huge instability at the range of hours and days. And obviously next we analyzed what happens after perturbation is ba in, with baclofen and you can see that results are very similar and when you quantify and average all of this, you can see that without any perturbation, 80% of neurons are unstable, okay? And when we have a drug perturbation, you just increase this instability even more, but I think it's uh, uh, not uh, really significant. So basically, based on uh, this electrophysiological data, we concluded that firing rate, first of all, is unstable at the level of single neurons, and the firing rate compensation is not really precise, right? So it, it's coming back roughly, but not exactly the, at the same level. And uh, uh, based on this, we were a little bit nervous, right? Because it was, uh, did not match any, any uh, data in the literature without having this kind of data, but any assumptions. So we decided that we have to have another proof. It's not enough because still everyone who record from um, extracellular, right, from electrodes, all of us understand that analysis is based on algorithms to separate neurons to single units. And we always, we try to prove that we are okay, but it, it is never uh, absolute proof. So we decided to go for another direction and use another method like a calcium imaging using GCAM6 construct, which is really working beautifully, and uh, see if we get similar results or not. So obviously uh, in this audience, I don't have to explain the differences between methods, right? In this case, the obvious advantage for us was that we can visualize very nicely the neurons, right? You can see 
how beautiful this in, in cultures. It's very simple and, and very, very easy for analysis, much more difficult in vivo, what we are trying now to do. And uh, we really quantified precisely in cultures, again, it's very simple, we, uh, the relationship between number of action potentials that we give to neuron, right, and the delta F over F signals that we get. And you can see that this correlation is pretty linear up to 10 action potential up to uh, 50 hertz that we worked. So we thought it could be a good uh, technique to analyze the mean firing rate stability. And uh, this is the raw data or a snapshot of raw data. You can see, uh, again, a lot of activity. And for GCAMP6, in our condition, we have very good resolution for single spike. So this is and very nice dynamic range. So we really were happy to work with this. You can see Baclofen acutely just inhibit all the spikes in the network. And you can see that after two days, it comes back, and this is average da data. Uh, these are uh, log uh, distributions. And uh, this is data at the individual neuron level, again. And this is final statistics. We got a little bit different numbers, but I think the main conclusion has been confirmed. More than 50% of neurons uh, based on calcium imaging are unstable. Okay. So the next question that we ask, as I already um, presented, what other parameters may be network trying to maintain stable? And obviously, as you see from the raw data, one of the major changes that we found is that Baclofen make uh, uh, network activity really synchronized, right? And I'm not going now to discuss why. There are many reasons why it does so. And you can see, and then we asked where, whether the um, patterns or synchrony of neuronal activity is also homeostatically maintained. And you can see this is analysis uh, at the level of uh, network, analysis of network burst. We made different kind of uh, analysis. I just sh show you a few. And this is analysis at the level of single neuron. And again, you can see that at the level of uh, network, OK, here, system comes back. However, when we analyze at the level of individual neurons, you can see in this case, 40% were unstable in control in terms of synchrony, and baclofen make it worse. So 60% were unstable uh, two days in the presence of baclofen, despite right stability at the level of population. And obviously, we say, OK, if network really precisely maintain mean rate and pattern. So what are the mechanisms that underline uh, this stability? And obviously, the first thing that we measured is the balance of excitation to inhibition, which really is a very important parameter for uh, firing rate of neurons. And you can see that baclofen profoundly inhibits both excitation and inhibition. Okay, And this is the calculation of conductance at each, at each neuron. At the same neuron, we measure both of them. And you can see that the ratio of inhibition to excitation going up, but it comes back two days uh, in the presence of baclofen, reflecting basically homeostasis of uh, firing rate. And then we asked, OK, so which uh, changes really enable uh, this homeostasis? And again, we measure uh, quantal events, miniature EPC events at the level of single neuron. And you can see that quantal amplitude is increased a little bit, right? Around 20% increase two days in the presence of baclofen. And we got really profound changes in uh, frequency of miniature synaptic events, meaning that quantal, uh, that release of glutamate and abundance of AMPA receptors are completely changed, right? In the presence of baclofen after two days. Obviously, we measured excitability of neurons, and you can see that excitability was really increased two days in the presence of baclofen. And you can see also the passive properties of neuron, like resting membrane potential, become more depolarizing, and input resistance is increased. So basically, we got enormous amount, and I, I can continue with this, enormous amount of changes. So. I, I believe that each conductance that would, would, would be isolated would be affected, almost e each one of them, right? And th then 
the next question that we ask, as I told you, the, the biggest prediction, so the, how this field of homeostatic plasticity started from a theoretical point of view, okay? People start to make a modeling based on Hebbian-like plasticity and could not get stability in these models, and then they concluded that it should be some homeostatic rule underlying uh, neuronal networks, and basically they assume that if we have a network that uses synaptic scaling, right, using just by increasing or decreasing the number of AMP receptors per synapse, we can just change the relative distribution of the synaptic strengths, but we can preserve the learning rules and in this network constant. And then we ask, obviously, we already knew that we have a very significant presynaptic changes, as I show you, in this network. And then we ask, what's about learning rules, right? And we did very simple measurement of short-term synaptic plasticity, right, which is extremely important for working memory function and for basic neuronal computation. We used uh, presynaptic imaging to calculate short-term synaptic plasticity. It can be done very precisely. And you can see that under control condition, we have a plastic network, 1.6 around plasticity. At the presynaptic site, after four hours baclofen, this plasticity is reduced. And after two days in the presence of baclofen, this plasticity is eliminated. So one is there is no plasticity, OK? So basically, you can see that the network that I describe you, right? And we do it under the same conditions. This is the same neuron, the same drug, the same experimenter. We measure once population activity, right? And once now we measure synaptic activity, again, uh, of its average of hundreds of synapses in network, and we can see that this network does not preserve at least short-term synaptic plasticity. And then we speculated, we say that maybe impairments of short-term synaptic plasticity, it's a trade-off, right, resulting from system's effort to really maintain phenotypic stability of spontaneous population firing patterns. And I think really an important question to ask, especially as uh, to understand really uh, disease, any brain disorder or a possible cure for brain disorder, is it possible theoretically and practically to find a, so a solution, right, when the network preserve phenotypic stability of popula population firing properties and maintain plasticity, okay? And I think this is really a, an important question to address, and we are working on this. And basically, uh, the conclusions from uh, this part is that invariant population mean rate and pattern of spontaneous spiking activity can emerge from highly diverse combinations of synaptic strengths and intrinsic neuronal properties. And for us, it was extremely important to see in the same system because I am my education as synaptic physiologist and I think we never combine different uh, levels on, of investigation. We have synaptic physiologists studying LTP, LTD. We have system neuroscience studying spiking activity in vivo. And it's really very difficult to combine all of these measurements and to get really understanding in uh, one functional system. And obviously, we would be very happy to check some of these questions in vivo as well. It's very difficult. And uh, the second question, uh, the second uh, conclusion is that observed uh, micro instability of individual neurons is really intrinsic and it takes play, uh, place in a highly controlled environment of cultures, irrespective, right, of changes in experience of animal and behavioral states and in interactions with cortex and so on. So it's an intrinsic property of uh, elementary circuitry. While firing microstability is robustly and accurately maintained by homeostatic control system in face of perturbations and uncertainties, the ability of synapses to discriminate input pattern, as I show you, uh, was sacrificed, measured by short-term synaptic plasticity. And based on all of this, on all of these results, um, we concluded that the observed differences in precision of homeostatic control system at different special scales really challenge the cell autonomous theory of network homeostasis and suggest existence of network-wide uh, regulation rules. However, I show you now example of really uh, very nice, I think, uh, uh, robust data suggesting that 
uh, normally system can maintain some properties, right? Like mean uh, rate and firing uh, pattern. However, nervous system do not always behave homeostatically, as you know, right? And we know that some mutations and some perturbations in our life induce a compensatory response that can restore network firing properties, but others remain uncompensated or compensation leads to pathological function, right? And the questions that we ask, or proposals that we make and we are trying now to address it, we say that numerous uh, neurodegenerative disorders, and I would say numerous brain disorders, not only neurodegenerative disorders, often result in a similar or overlapping set of cognitive dysfunctions, okay, or memory impairments. And we hypothesize that the failure in neuronal homeostatic system may be lead to these common clinical endpoints. And uh, the first uh, question, which is related to the first part that we ask, I told you that we randomly choose GABA B receptors, and it's true, we really randomly choose it just for, as an example, right, for perturbation. But then we start to look literature and we say, do GABA B receptors really involved in control of firing rate homeostasis? And we found many papers from uh, labs and some of them the labs of our collaborators who made transgenic mice lacking GABA B receptors. And uh, we were surprised to discover, because it's not a common target of epilepsy, right? But we were surprised to discover that all of these mice had very severe seizure profile. And then we ask, maybe GABA B receptor are really one of the key regulator proteins which are important for uh, this uh, point. And uh, um, several years ago, we had uh, a paper studying activity of GABA B receptors using single synapse level, using FRED technology. And at that point, <coughs> we discovered that differences in local GABA level at synapses can really contribute to differences in or heterogeneity in synaptic strengths at the level of individual synapses. And uh, we asked very simple question, do GABA B receptors are really essential for maintaining stability of firing rate? To address it, I will show you a very similar example, very simple example. Until now, I just show you inhibition of firing rate, right, and renormalization. Now we say, what happens if we enhance firing rate by obviously blocking the most simple thing was to do to block GABA-A receptors, right? So we use GABA zinc to block GABA-A receptors, and you see enormous increase in firing rate on average, more than threefold, and you can see gradual renormalization of firing rate. We repeat very similar experiment with GABA-B receptor. You know, there is only two types of receptors for GABA, or GABA-A eunotropic or GABA-B metabotropic. There is not too much diversity in this, in this case. And we were really surprised to discover that when we blocked the GABA-B receptor by, antagon by specific antagonist, you can see the firing rate was incapable to renormalize. And uh, obviously, at this stage, we had many questions, right? How we can explain these results? For example, one of very simple explanation at that time was, OK, maybe system does not care. It's just increase of 50% in firing rate. Maybe it's OK for the system, and it does not provoke any homeostatic control in this case. And uh, you can see when we block GABA-A receptors, obviously, the increase is uh, it's, uh, more than threefold. So to address it, we just decided to add these two <coughs> antagonists together, and the results were very uh, uh, clear, right? When we block all the GABA receptors, system go up by fourfold. However, it does not, it's incapable to come in back, and obviously the conclusion that it's due to GABA B receptor blockage. I will not bother you with all this. So uh, we, in this paper, we really dealt with molecular mechanisms explaining this lack of homeostasis. I just show you the conclusions that we reach. So we found that GABA-B receptor is essential to control homeostasis of firing rate because it works as a GABA sensor at, at synapses, okay? We proved it before, it's non-saturated by GABA it can be uh, hyperactivated or, or hypoactivated. 
And this uh, receptor can control firing rate by controlling three major steps in homeostatic control. First of all, postsynaptic receptors are essential for controlling quantal uh, scaling of quantal amplitude. Presynaptic GABA B receptors are essential for controlling presynaptic calcium flux homeostasis. And the new really discovery when, uh, which we made in this paper, and this is the first time that I think anyone showed that the G protein coupled receptors can control the conformation of syntaxin, which is essential, right? The switch of syntaxin is essential for snare complex assembly. So basically, calcium flux and syntaxin conformation switch really controls the regulation of release probability and together with controlling quantal amplitude, <coughs> it's really essential for myostatic uh, regulation of firing rate. And another example of uh, lack of homeostasis in the system that we discovered recently occurred during uh, much more uh, relevant in vivo perturbation. So we used very simple paradigms that many people use from uh, Hubel and Weasel, right, for last already almost 50 years, right? We just did sensory deprivation. In, in this case, we used not visual deprivation, but whisker deprivation, right? We took uh, animals, we waited for formation of barrel cortex. We did not want to damage the functionality of barrel cortex. We trimmed whiskers from uh, uh, P10 to uh, P16. And then we start to record, but the important issue is that we recorded not in barrel cortex, we recorded in the hippocampus. Okay, we have a huge amount of information about how sensory activity or sensory deprivation shapes circuitry in primary sensory cortex. And also all of us know that information or sensory information from primary sensory cortex come into high order sensory cortex and in the end through entorhinal cortex, all sensory inputs reach the hippocampus and we could not find almost any information what the hippocampus does with the sensory input and whether hippocampus is affected by the sensory input or, or sensory disuse. And you can see and uh, when we measure very simple input-output relationship in say one region of hippocampus, you can see that there is nothing about homeostasis here, right? We found that the input-output relationship or the slope of this uh, uh, fiber volume and EPSP amplitude or slope has been reduced. It has been, uh, we showed that it comes from presynaptic part. For example, you can see that short-term facilitation of animals at high frequency has been extensively, really profoundly enhanced and the release probability, I don't show it here, has been reduced. Quantal amplitude has been reduced and even we made an effort to measure excitability in C3 neurons. You can see that also excitability of C3 neurons has been reduced. So first of all, this was the, really the first uh, results showing that hippocampus is profoundly affected by sensory disuse. And second, what really bothers me, why the hippocampus is incapable to maintain homeostasis while we have all the other senses, right, to compensate for this perturbation. And really, I would like to finish uh, with the importance of this topic for studying of neurodegenerative disorders, which we are dealing for the last uh, seven years. And I would like to show you that there is an enormous amount of literature showing that the major familial mutations in Alzheimer's disease, okay, it's more than 150 mutations that have been discovered, can uh, in many, many cases enhance the balance of excitation to inhibition and cause hyperactivity. Sorry. Uh, it can be done all by a reduction in inhibitory tone. Uh, for example, beautiful work has been done by uh, George Pallop and the Leonard Mocky lab showing that the deficits in parvalbumin positive cells can uh, contribute to this. Or increase in excited return, for example, uh, papers from Arthur Connert lab, from my own lab, uh, and recent really work, very nice work in, in vivo page by Stefan Remy really uh, contributed to this idea that increase in hyperactivity is occurring in uh, Alzheimer's disease model. And what is really interesting is that it has been recently shown that in human, okay, uh, mild cognitive impairment patients, 
which is a risk factor for Alzheimer's disease, only 50% of them get there, right, in amnestic patients. There is a hyperactivity in specifically in the hippocampal region, specifically in dente gyrus and CS3 region. And what is really uh, unclear to all of, uh, all of us that after screening of all the anti-epileptic drug, only single drug, which is the most unusual anti-epileptic drug, levetiracetam, it does not work at any iron channel, it works at presynaptic CV2A protein, and no one really understands what it does. This was the only drug which reduced uh, hyperactivity of this channel, and currently we are working in many of um, other labs trying to understand really the mechanism of this hyperactivity and the really crucial questions that we would like to address whether this hyperactivity is a result of initial mutation or initial perturbation or it's a result of the failure in the homeostatic control system. And I am finishing. I would like to thank my lab and mainly people who contributed to this uh, for the work I show. Uh, Ed and Boz and Ira in my lab contributed most of the data. And obviously for all collabor uh, collaborators, especially for Eli, who is here, who helped us a lot for um, analysis of the data and all, all the others, and basically, of course, for finding agencies. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.